welcome everybody and thank you for being here. So today we have with us Diane Broussard, who's a spiritual healer and teacher and the owner and operator of the Diamond Springs Center of Healing Arts and Training, located in Diamond Springs, California. We also have Vicki Dobbs, the founder of Wisdom Evolution and the You First Evolution. Vicki is an author, teacher and guide, a connoisseur of creativity, <laughs> sharing her practical wisdom tips and tools for nurturing body, mind, heart and soul. We have Lionel Friedberg, Emmy Award winning filmmaker, New York Times and Los Angeles best selling author with a wide variety of interests, including ancient history, investigations into the nature of human consciousness and studies of the paranormal. Lionel also has got a huge background in film and, and writing generally. And finally, yours truly, Kim Parker, wisdom worker, author, shamanic practitioner, and lifelong experiencer of non-ordinary events with a commitment to sharing accounts of the extraordinary and investigating consciousness and our human belief systems. We tend to assume people know what shamans are, but having done a, a, a short poll of people generally, I discovered most people really don't or they have odd concepts of it. So I wondered if we'd just discuss what a shaman is. I'll start off. I decided for me, shaman is more a state of being than it is anything else. It's not really the domain or purview of any one form of religion or culture or dogma. It's actually a state of being. And I quite liked a concept I got from physics, uh, which illustrates that elementary particles have a dual nature depending on the position of the observer, particle of waves. So I wondered if shamans tend to stand as the observer from a wave perspective. And that is they, they understand that it is all the one consciousness and the one life force. And whether a lot of other people are still standing from the particle perspective and the resultant idea that they're separate from life in general or other lives in general. So that's my idea on shamanism. So um, Vicky, can I ask you? For me, shamanism is founded on and based in a sacred trust between humanity and the natural world. So for me, it's a recognition that there is light or life force in all things, animate and inanimate. And if that's an understanding that you hold as your truth, then communication with all of the light is available to everybody. Yeah, I love that. Diane? Uh, I'm going to go even a little bit more basic than that. I think to me, because I work with the upper and lower fields, shamanism is a way to travel into non-ordinary reality. And it's been a part of our ancestors since Lemuria, since the beginning of time. It's very basic. It's something that's been taught from children to adults about being able to travel, being able to trust um, the shaman in the, in the group who is able to connect with non-ordinary reality. They had no way of building and doing any of the things they did in the original times. So, you know, the shaman is the one who was able to connect with spirit and bring in energy and uh, um, witnessing for the, for the, for the group and it was really really important because that's all they had at the time and we have more or less forgotten this but we're bringing it back because it's really really important it's very basic for us to connect with the earth with the energy of the earth and what she has to teach us about connecting with spirit yeah beautiful yeah and lionel yes i, th I think that that sums it up very nicely you know prior to the invention of uh, the kind of technology that we have now, where we're all interconnected. This system that we're using right now is a prime example of that. Prior to that, people lived in little isolated pockets, right? And in, in rural areas and all over the place, you know? So, and every society that I know of around the world, and I haven't been to all of them, but those that I have visited, you have your local healer, your local go-to person, who connects you with a higher realm, if you like, uh, who is connected with the spirit world. And it really is to do with nature. 
A shaman is someone who is very, very closely connected with, with nature. There are no academic institutions, or there certainly weren't. You mentioned earlier on one of you going back to Lemuria, and I'm quite sure it does go back as far as that, and perhaps even before that. But f with recent history, as we know, for the last few thousand years, shamans have been in existence in all societies all over the planet. It is only now that we, with our sophisticated you know, institutions, are beginning to recognize them. The Western world is beginning to recognize the, the, the reality of shamanism because they've been around for a long, long time. And these are people who are deeply connected with truths that a lot of us have, have we, we've probably forgotten about them. It's been taken away from our culture and mm -hmm. they still are very much connected to that. The natural world, the essence of what Gaia is all about. Yeah, that's true. And, and it really was taken away from us, that concept, wasn't it, in the West entirely? Yes, we needn't point fingers at anybody, but obviously there were reasons that, that you know, from, from, from politics, from rulers, from kings, religions, I think, had a lot to do with this. It was removed from society. It was removed from our, from our gestalt. It's now gone. We've, and, and, and we've lost it. And what we need to do is to go back to some of those realities. A lot of people say to me, well, how, how do you introduce a child to the sort of concepts that you're talking about, particularly the sort of things that, that, I, that I wrote about in my, in my book about African shamans. And I said, well, it's very simple. Take the child away from the iPad and away from the electronic device. Get rid of that. Turn off the power. Take the battery out. Take the child into the mountains. Go and smell the pine trees. Go in a canoe. Go down the river. Hear the water. Hear the birds. Feel the wind. Feel the rain. And let the child connect with nature. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. so many children are deprived of that uh, uh, opportunity today, which is such a sad thing. You know, they, their world exists on a, on a little glass electronic screen. Yeah. Not real world. I, I would like to add to that because I am, I do counseling also here at my center. And recently, for some reason, the universe has brought some children to me. And mm -hmm. some of these children are quote unquote ADHD or all these things their parents can't really understand. And I said to myself, well, you know, why are you bringing them here? And it's because they've been to um, psychotherapy for children and all these other things, which is not working. And when I bring them here, very, very simply, for me, the only thing that a child needs to know is that he's important, that he's beautiful, that he's a fractal of spirit, and that he's loved, and there's nothing wrong with him. And when I take him back, I bring him back into the basics. Again, drumming. Can you hear that drum? Meditation. Children easily, easily, easily go into places that you want to bring them. But they've not been taught this. And not only that, it's been erased from their vocabulary. Exactly. The, the children from the different indigenous tribes were raised this way. They trusted the shaman. They knew, This is the talking stick. This is what they did. And that's been taken away, especially through religion and through belief, society, school. I've seen these children. I've seen, I see what happens and I'm so amazed. It's like, what do I do with? This child has been diagnosed with all this stuff. And for me, I just teach him that he's a beautiful being, you know, and let him beat the drum and find his own heart. And I think that's what that's what we're here to do is connect ourselves back with spirit through the earth, the consciousness of Gaia. Mm -hmm. It's so simple. Get back to basics. <laughs> it's not we don't need to label people. You know, you have this, 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 this. And what does that mean to a child? You know, I mean, actually, it means that he's not too cool if he's got these names. Yeah. You know, you're, you're beautiful. You're, you're a beautiful child. And I, I say that, my friend, just because, like I said, recently I've had children come to me and it's not something I've asked for. But I think it's because the children are the way to the future for us. Oh, 100 percent, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. I think one of the things that our children are missing is the ability to listen. They hear but they don't listen. And I think there's dis distinction there. And, and I have this wonderful picture on my phone that I, I look at often of my grandson when he was maybe two. And he brought me a stick. 
and we're out in the front yard. And I said, oh, I bet that stick came from that tree over there. Should we go ask it? And he walked right over to the tree, wrapped his arms around it, laid his head up against <laughs> it. And you could just literally in his eyes see him go away with the tree. And it was oh, the yeah. most wonderful experience. And, and he yeah. was in that moment listening. I mean, we, we all hear, but we've, we've washed away the ability for our little ones to listen. A lot of that is to do with the amount of distractions that go on. They are all too distracted all yeah. the time mm -hmm. you know, by all these other offerings out there from this digital world. These yeah. distractions are endless, be it music or entertainment or these violent games, you know, that people, it's, it's, it's all these distractions lure them away from where they should be going. And it and, isn't you know, just I, our children today. It isn't just the digital world. It's I was 30 years old before I figured out yes, that, exactly, that yeah. there was a difference between no sound and silence. And yeah. I was absolutely stunned when I realized how much there was to listen to in silence. Yes, of course. Absolutely. So even myself as a child, I didn't learn how to listen. Well, all of us, I mean, you know, of course, we've all been exposed to that ever since, you know, I, I would say from after World War II, the world really changed dramatically. And we've all been exposed to that. So we've all gone through that. But kids today, there is so much on the plate available to them. Yes. That I'm not surprised that they are being pulled and, you know, uh, the amount of violence that goes on. And just if you look at what's going on in the United States in the last few days, I mean, it's absolutely horrific. And I think a lot of it has to do with a detachment from reality, a detachment from the real world. The fact that violence is entertainment right. and an escape, yes. you know. Yeah. I'm not surprised that these awful events happen like what happened now in Texas and elsewhere, you know. It's separating them from their hearts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a great it's part of humanity that we are all a part of. Yeah. It is part of us. Mm -hmm. It is that part of us maybe we don't want to look at, but it's up to us to hold the light. Yeah. To raise our consciousness to be able to watch this and try and level out what's going on we're all one you know we, we can't separate our, ourselves from what's going on we're absolutely all one in fact in in, in this uh, a book which i wrote on shamanism in africa I'm a, and i talk a lot about my experience making films all over the world and I, one of the things i say in in that uh, in the last chapter what i have learned over the years is that i really am absolutely convinced that whether you're a person or a pony or a petunia we are all connected. I totally and utterly understand what you're saying. And I was busily preaching connections and all the rest of it for years. We don't even have a, a, a working language. That's how lost we've got for oneness. Yeah. Because I woke up one morning and a voice said to me, intelligent beings don't have connections. No. And I understood consciousness. It meant that there is not that the, the very word connection implies two things with something going between Different. them. Yeah. Yeah. That or multiple things with things going between them. In actual fact, oneness is a step further than that. It's it's a, that real. That took me years, which is, you know, you, those sorts of understandings mm -hmm. can take decades, can't they, really? Yeah. It's yeah. the absence of separation. It's yeah. the absence of labels. Every label that's attached to anybody at any point creates a degree of separation. Exactly. Whether wow. it's, you know, I'm awake and you're asleep. That's a degree of separation. Mm. Yes. And the more we're separated, the easier we are to control and profit from. In our being, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> that's the way it's always been in the world. Yes. Yes, but it doesn't mean it can't change. <laughs> it is changing. It absolutely is 100% changing. You know, I mean, I, this is one of the things that is so profound right now is especially, you know, that people are understanding what you do matters. What you do matters as an individual to your brother next door, to your brother across the way. And every time that you overcome something in your life, you overcome it for your brothers and sisters. You know, every time that you can see something and bring peace to a subject, you help your brothers and sisters. And this is how we're raising the consciousness of humanity. 
all of us together. And it's so beautiful. Once people get this, they realize they have a responsibility. They're human. And we're going somewhere. And it's kind of cool. And we're all going together. And I love that. <laughs> I think one of our teachers, and you as well, Diane, with Don Oscar, I was going through pictures and, and last night just getting rid of stuff on my phone and found this screenshot I had taken of one of his messages. And he writes, this is Don Oscar Miro Caseta, the um, heart of the healer, the Pachacuti Mesa tradition of cross-cultural shamanism. And he writes, never before has there been a greater need than now for a resonant field, a self restorative shamanic consciousness and servants to the emergence of a spiritually adept planetary culture founded upon sacred trust between humankind and the natural world. The embrace of shamanism as a life path leads to the generously unhindered beneficence of self. That's a lot of big words, but it, it says what I think we're all trying to say, this emerging consciousness that is without separation, that it is a you matter, I matter, we matter, everything matters. The time is now for, for us to make that commitment because the energy is here. The guides are here from all over the universe. We talk about the, ET, the galactic guides are here. The angelic guides, were, we are being guided into a higher frequency, a higher consciousness, into a new earth. We're being guided to do that in every single way that we can. And the easiest way to help people that I can see that are looking, because we're all, the, the energy from the earth is so powerful right now. People are feeling it and they don't know what to do with it. The easiest way for me, because I'm dealing with lots of people, especially 94 year old mother who's very old school is to just get into the earth, beat the drum, feel the consciousness of the earth. It helps you connect to your own soul, which is what we're all trying to do. And that's why I love the work of bringing back the basic shamanic tradition. You know, it's very, very simple connecting to the consciousness of the earth, which connects you to your own consciousness, which connects you to spirit all of us moving into this. But, you know, again, what it does that we're doing right now is we're realizing that some of the old patterns aren't working anymore and we need to release these old patterns and beliefs. That's the most, probably the most biggest thing we can do now is release the old patterns so that there's room for the new. Once we release the old patterns and beliefs and judgments and opinions, and just like Vicki said, the thoughts that we have for others, we release them in comes the new. And that's what we're creating is the new right now. And it's really, really exciting. And I think that's what I see in that picture there of earth, beautiful new earth, a golden earth. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm feeling very deeply. Mm -hmm. Diane, you were talking about how it's happening now and there's changes happening all over the place. I've had this concept going on in my head that shamans are reincarnating all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's time. So you agree with that? Yes. I, I think it makes sense. In fact, I believe okay. somebody wrote a book about the time, the people, the time of the black Jaguar people or something along those lines. Mm. I think when you, you look at the amount of interest in the shamanic world and the number of teachers that have emerged in the last 20 years and the massive followings that these teachers have, you can't help but recognize that the shamanic world is making itself more prevalently known as a way of sustaining one's life in, in these turbulent times. I think the power of our shamanic world lies in our belief that what you believe is real, as we've been told a million times by our blessed Lynn, and it's in that belief, in the believing of those thoughts and the things that we see that we go, oh my gosh, did I see that? Rather than question it just in the believing of it, that's really, for me, a, a foundational basic in the practice of shamanism is moving past that questioning and just allowing it to be real. 
in whatever form a vision and experience a um, thought has come to you is that's that's a basis we have tools that allow us to move out of this ordinary reality but without the belief that where we go is real then it's just a dream it, it's just our minds telling us stories where you can have and experience very visceral things happening that you can touch and smell and and feel in non-ordinary reality. And I think that's where, again, the foundation is believing that. And when you believe, you can. Lynn you're referring to is Lynn Andrews, whom yeah. you, I, and Diane have all studied under at some stage. So yes, wonderful teacher of spiritual values and shamanism. There is an upwelling now of curiosity among so many people in society, desperately looking for alternatives. This quest for wanting to know more, and you particularly find this among young people, they want to know things, they want to, they want to learn. Uh, there is a, we, we're often, we, we, we tend to dismiss young people as though, you know, they, they're being led by the cabal or whoever you, you one wants to think about pulling the strings or whatever your philosophy may be. But I think that there is a growing sense of, of, uh, of an awareness and a need to know more. And, and people want to know that. And they don't always have the opportunity to get that. You know, I'm a filmmaker and I've been making movies for 50 odd years of my life. And, and, and I think that the media and the film industry has a lot to do with the dumbing down of society. But at the same time, a rise in science fiction, you know, and I'm thinking science fiction, good quality science fiction of the Ray Bradbury type of science fiction, you know, and the Robert Heinlein, you know, the, 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 the giants, the Isaac Asimovs, the Arthur C. Clarks. This um, has also uh, brought about a new sense of awareness, opened wide people's minds to consider maybe there is more and maybe there is more beyond the horizon than what I've been told. And that's a good thing. Absolutely. I think they have to find a source other than their computers to research it. I think this is where the people who are prevalent in the forefront of this movement need to be accessible in a, a conversational manner so that these young people questing for this knowledge, they have so much to ask. And at this point, the majority of them are asking their computers and you know, that's a filtered source. That's so yeah. finding yes. access to people like you, Lionel, and having a conversation like this, imagining that there are a thousand teenagers on the other side of the screen listening to you, but they're listening mm -hmm. to you. They're not reading a filtered version of what you said somewhere in the past. Yes, exactly. Um, so we need more forums or fora, whatever the terminology is like this, where people can participate and yes. ask questions. You know, there should be more of us. And, and I think that, that, that with the spread of uh, systems like Zoom, this is becoming more and more available. For example, one, one of the things that my wife and I do, we belong to, although we, we've been making movies for all our lives, but we belong to what we call the COVID classic cinema club. And we get together and we talk about old movies um, among uh, friends, people who are in the film industry. I mean, we've all seen these old movies going back to the 30s and 40s and 50s. And we decided, well, now that we're all locked up and now we've got this wonderful system called Zoom, let's talk about old movies together, you know? so. Kids should be able to do that as well. And I can see this with my grandchildren, my two grandchildren in Chicago, particularly uh, the, the older one there. He's, he's got this insatiable sense of inquiry and he wants to know. And there isn't always a place for him to go to get that. But Zoom exists, furthering of the availability of forums like this that they can have access to. Yes. And I wish the school system would come aboard, but you know, that's uh, not going to happen no. tomorrow. Hey, they're uh, only going children. to keep people in a box. The, the students, yeah. they, they have a box to teach from and 
unfortunately, you know, they're blessed to have some teachers who, who will share outside the box. But for the most part, the teachers have no alternative but to, to teach from oh, no, their box. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The narrow box. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So who does it fall upon? Does it fall upon the parent? Does it, how do we help people to d- develop this, to generate this, to spread this? Well, we each do. One thing is us. We are star seeds here. We need to let those kids say, it's okay to break the box. You know, they're products of centuries and centuries of the old box, you know, and I'm speaking because I have a 94 year old mother and I'm blessed to be able to talk and I have grandkids. But what happens is we need to be able to give them permission to say, this doesn't work anymore. This is, you know, old religion. This is old this and old that. And the parents need to allow that because these kids need to be able to break out of that box and to be able to explore the newness, you know? So it's, it's a, it's a process of releasing the old paradigms, the old beliefs, the old religions, the old system, letting them understand where that came from. Not like, Hey, wow, you can do this now. It's like, this is how we've come. This is where we're progressing. We're removing some of these old things that don't matter anymore. How did they find us? That's tough, but we have to stand up and be the source maybe for our kids, our grandkids, whatever it is, and stand there and show them there is something different. You know, if grandma can do that or mom can do that, we need to stand up and say there is something. You are okay to be out of the box. But do parents feel good to say, we, we you know, parents, I think, are happy to be able to keep their kids busy with other things because yeah. they're not responsible anymore. It's coming back to the distraction. Go to your mm-hmm. to your distraction. Go to your screen. Leave me alone. I've got my own stuff to deal with. Mm-hmm. Be so. responsible. You know, being responsible for for humanity. Not, I mean, mm-hmm. not for yourself, yes, but for humanity. And you know, it's time for there is. I call them star seeds all over the world right now. It is, and they're coming, and they're. They're being activated. It's like you can't sit still anymore, guys. You got to do something. Mm-hmm. And they do need, we do need, all of us need to stand up and say, yes, it's time. Take a stand, whatever we're doing. Kim, sitting here talking to us, you know, a little bit, put it out there for that one person that goes to another one person to stand because the kids, the kids are the ones, you know, they're the ones yeah. that are coming up and they're going to be changing this earth. So they need to have somebody to look at. Where do we go? Who do we see? You know, it's us, guys. And it's us all over the world that are going to stand up and say, there is, you do not need to be in this box anymore. You know, I mean, and that's tough, but you have to do that. It was a couple of years ago, I I woke up and, and Spirit said to me, we want you to start GOSH. And I went, what the hell's that? Okay, but what is that? And it was an acronym for gatherings over strange happenings and I now do that every bi-weekly for Americans every four yeah, that's, that's for everybody what you're else. doing that's, that's and what, I, what do. I do I stepped out of my box which I, I'm not particularly I'm a shy sort of lady who likes my own company um, but you're right we have to break out of our box the box where we've been conditioned if we are in many cases long-term experiences of non-ordinary things you you kept quiet because it was the only way to be safe. You called crazy. They lock you up. They want to treat you. So we have to step out of that box and say, well, you know what? I, I can't really be crazy because I function well in society, probably better than many others at the moment. And I'm all about kindness and wisdom and compassion. So maybe... It's time for me to step out of that box and spread the way to that. Yeah. As the light comes up into the world right now, and it's very, very big, you know, it's going to find bodies that are going to accept it. And those are these star seeds, and they're going to take the energy from above, radiating the light. Because here's these kids going, what do we do? You know, how are we going to, to we don't, this is not working anymore. So they're going to gravitate to the light, which is the ones that are actually accepting it. So we're like anchors. You know, we're anchoring in this light. These old crotchety, some of us, not some of us are young and cool, but, you know, myself, whatever. 
all around the world. And the kids are going to go gravitate to the light. They're going to do that. But if we don't anchor it in, there's no place for the light to even go. So it's so, really important. So really, we have to be courageous, don't we, to step out of those boxes, to really put ourselves out there now. Yes. Yeah. We're being asked. We have to practice what we preach. And, and that isn't even the, the, the practice of preaching. It's living, no. a tr it's, it's living the truth of who we are. And so we lead by example. It's, it's allowing for the box to be amoeba-like instead of wooden so that it has flexible boundaries and people feel more comfortable within a boundary, it feels safe, but rather than treat it like a box that has four corners and, and pointy sides and, and you get stuck in, it's, it's flexible, it's amoebic, it moves, so that it allows for them to experience something different without feeling like they've stepped outside the norm. So that flexibility, that, that constant pulsating movement that that I can, my grandson at eight, seven, six slept in his closet. Well, nobody told him he couldn't. That, that was, he made a bed, he had his toys, he'd go in the closet, close the door, good night. And what, what it, reason did he give you between that? Did he, did he explain that to you? Did, did he, anyone he's never ask? really explained it. And he tells me now he doesn't remember doing it. But he was, as a child without language, he, without words, he had language and he would sit in the closet and carry on conversations. And I'm blessed that, that my daughter doesn't share a lot of this openly, but she doesn't put a damper on anything that comes from her children. So in her mind, if that's the way he gets to know his uncle, so be it. For me, he's a massive storyteller. His imagination is off the charts. The things he comes up with always blow me away. Unfortunately, a lot of it is weapons. So grandma's always <laughs> talking about if it's a laser that does that, does the other end of it fix whatever it is that's, you know, let's let's have a healing laser, not just a destructive one. And so he's got this engineer brain going that at almost 13 is, is at least thinking, especially around grandma who doesn't like to hear about things that blow up and explode and get torn apart. It's how do we put them back together? How, how do we yeah. fix that? So the imagination is what needs to be encouraged in these little ones. It's not just about languaging things that they may feel or their parents may feel are strange and weird or occult or crazy. It's about giving them permission to think mm -hmm. explosively. Exactly. And the thing is, you know, I've always said to my, to my children, all of them, I said, never be embarrassed because it's okay to be different. Yes. It really is okay to be different. Don't feel guilty about being different. If you feel in any way different, there's nothing to be ashamed about. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's okay to be that way. Kids need to have that reaffirmed all the time. They because, need you know, permission to, to be themselves. To be themselves. However, there have to be certain parameters that one has to live by because we do live in a society with right. one another. But yeah, absolutely spread the, uh, the edges of who you are. Just be, it's okay to be different, whether it's LGBTQ or whatever it is, it's okay. And you don't have to feel guilty about that. That's who you are. And you, and you do the best you can with who you are, you know, and go out, go on your journey. We're all on a journey, all of us. We all come into this world with some degree of negativity and some degree of positivity. Maybe that's something we inherited from the Akashic record. Maybe that's something we inherited from a previous life. You know, whatever the situation is, you do the best you can. And now you manage that. And it's okay to, you know, th these poor children who go around not knowing what to do. I mean, the amount of, 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 of kids that are sent to therapists in this country here in the United States just appalls me. The first thing the parents do or a teacher does, oh, he's got it. He needs or, or she needs therapy. No, they don't need therapy. Just need mm -mm. to talk about who you are and express yourself. I try to simple it down when it, it comes, especially to, to the grandkids. And I say, you know, what you imagine today will be real tomorrow. 
Because if yeah. you go to a comic book store and you find an old Dick Tracy comic book, he's yes. wearing a watch yes. that he can talk like on. Everybody <laughs> thought he was crazy, but guess what? Today it's real. And, yeah, exactly. and it, it simplifies it that much. It starts with a thought. And so yeah. think, kids, think. Think up the next world. Think up tomorrow. Think up the beauty that will surround you and whoever you become. I yeah. think there's another aspect to all of this, which is going to make us better human beings in the long run, as well as help the planet and, and, and do all sorts of other uh, things that, 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 that will have positive aspects to it. And that is, we need to expand our, our sense of compassion and our sense of respect. It's not just about each other. It's not just about humanity. You know, I, I love the story about the child running out to the garden and hugging the tree and asking, you know, the tree. <laughs> but we need to embrace and, 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 and have a respect and a relationship with nature. And that means all living things. Mm -hmm. And that includes the animal kingdom. And unfortunately, the animal kingdom is relegated to the shadows and made victims of this horrific animal agricultural industry, which is appalling for human health and all sorts of other things. These creatures are treated appallingly. We need to change our ways. You know how much negativity is being uh, generated by the way we treat the non-human world? We've got to fix that. We're all part of the same thing. We're all, we're all one. Yes, totally agree, Lionel. You look into the eye of a whale or yeah. you look into the eye of an octopus or you look into the eye of your favorite dog. What are you seeing? You see intelligence. You're seeing a soul. You know, we are all part of the same fabric. Absolutely. I'm going to bring this back to, to shamanism and talking to all things because consciousness is within all things, which is what a basic premise of shamanism to me is. So I'm going to tell you about being at a weekend seminar about beliefs because, as Vicky has brought up, beliefs uh, shape our perception of reality. It's, it's how we see the world. So what we believe is really important and what we don't believe is really important. So I was at this lovely weekend seminar and it was a break and uh, it was an old convent and I went out into the, uh, the courtyard during the break and I was aware that I was just staring at this plant, which was a climbing plant, which was all over a wall, and I was fixated on this plant. And I thought to myself, why am I staring at this plant? And then it was as though something honed my vision in till what I was looking at was a flower bud and a tendril of the same plant had wound around the flower bud. And the plant had told me that it needed help. That's yes. how conscious it was. And as I went to uncurl that tendril, a voice actually said, I actually heard it say, careful, don't, don't break the tendril either. Mm. So I carefully unwound the tendril from around the bud. And because it was a weekend conference, the next day I went and checked on my flower bud. And yeah. although it was a little bruised in places, it was now starting to open. So oh, this is back to basic shamanism. It's everything we need to treat Absolutely. everything with respect and compassion i totally. totally get you what you're saying lionel so going back to basic shamanism how do you think a shaman gets chosen do you think spirit chooses i mean i know there's a modern concept that the tribe chooses you but i think spirit chooses you before the tribe accepts you if anyone else wants to answer that, please go ahead. Um, I can give you my take on the African uh, sh shamans, if you I'd, like. I'd love to, because your book <laughs> Forever in My Vines. Um, oh, I have a couple answers for it. But, you know, my belief is that we, we kind of sign a contract before we come here. Those of us that come here that agree to do the work that we agree to do have, are here. I mean, if it's doing shamanic work, if it's doing, you know, work to help humanity, we agree. It's a contract we sign. It's something we say, I will do. And I know there's a lot of different ways. Um, Peruvian shamanism, when you get hit by lightning, you know, that's the shaman. So you want to hide from the lightning or be what you are. But it's something that you agree to do before you come into this earth. And it's, you know, not everybody takes that, takes up the staff to do it. 
but those that are chosen know they've been chosen. And in the shamanic tribe, it is something that is, they're chosen and they know they're chosen because they're connected with spirit. So that's, that's what my deal is, is like, hey, we signed on to do this work and we're doing it or not. <laughs> well, or not. Not going to get you into trouble, but anyway. Not going to get you into trouble, but you know, it's because, you know, we, we come here of choice, of free choice. We come here because this is the deal. This is the place where we can learn and evolve and move into to higher consciousness, you know? So when we come here, many of us have been here thousands and thousands of times. And when we're coming here now specifically, it's because we've had lifetimes of being shamans. We know how to do this stuff. When we say we're gonna come back, we have it in our DNA to know how to do this. We, to know how to, to, to talk to spirit, to know how to bring in the energies of the earth and all of this. And that's my, my take. <laughs> talking thick down to Lionel and the African stuff because you're book forever in my veins. I'm, I'm partially through it and I really want to talk about one episode in there, but getting back to, yeah, shamanism and how people are chosen. Yeah, it's a fabulous book, Lionel. Uh, thank you. Diane, I, I, I agree with you entirely. We do sign up for what we find when we get here. We, before we manifest on the physical plane, we've made these arrangements. We've signed these contracts. That's what we've arranged to do. And we can, so of course we do know that. But when you are down here on the physical plane, it's difficult sometimes to understand that, because you know mm -hmm. people often say, "Well, why don't you remember that? Why aren't people able to remember past lives?" And my answer to that is, well, because it's like peaking during an exam. You you are here to learn. You don't want to be given information that you're supposed to uh, learn now from a previous lifetime because that's cheating the system. You've got to learn it now. So anyway, so we do come here with that knowledge, but we're, once we are down here on the physical plane and on this particular dimension, in Africa, the way uh, it, it happens with, with most of those tribes, and, I, and I, my experience is confined only to the southern parts of Africa from the Zambezi River southwards, all of those tribes. I have a great familiarity with working with all of those people. Those people are chosen to become a shaman, usually when they have a, 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 um, a, an illness and they would go and see a local shaman. Now, in Southern Africa, and I'm talking about South Africa and I'm talking about Mozambique and I'm talking about Namibia, uh, to a lesser extent, Zimbabwe and, uh, and to a lesser extent, Zambia and to a lesser extent, the Congo and Tan Tanzania, because there they go by other words, Naka, various names. But most, most of the shamans in Southern Africa are, are known as a Sangoma. Uh, Sangoma is a Zulu word, which basically can, I guess, can be translated to soothsayer, foreteller, uh, seer of truth, seer of uh, into the future. And, and so you go and see a Sangoma. So a lot of these people, when they get ill, and it usually happens in their puberty period of life or, or their very early years as a young adult, they either come up with a, a, an awful illness, mi migraines, uh, some kind of illness, and they go and consult a shaman, a sangoma, um, because a lot of people still live in rural areas. They won't go and see an allopathic Western doctor. First of all, it's expensive. Not everyone has access to that kind of medical care, but always down the road, you will find a sangoma. They are everywhere. And so they'll go and consult with the Sangoma. And what the Sangoma will then do is to try and diagnose why are you experiencing these headaches? Why have you got these terrible stomach pains? What's all that about? And if the Sangoma says, ah, it's because your ancestors are calling you, that's the key that they need to know that they have been chosen to become a shaman. Because the belief system is that the ancestors are the ones who choose you Obviously, you've made this arrangement before you've come here, but you, you don't remember that. But the ancestors are calling you back for, to, to what you do. Now, I'm going to give you an example. I'm, I'm going all over the map here a little bit, so forgive me for that. But a very, very dear friend of mine uh, who is a general surgeon who lives about an hour away from where I live here in California. I came down with her and, and Kim, I believe, is reading my book, so she may have come across this already. About 30 years ago, I was diagnosed with a pretty scary 
kidney condition, an autoimmune disorder. And I was told by my nephrologist, you know, you're going to be on dialysis within a year or you're not going to survive this. It's, it's a terminal illness. I didn't know what to do about this. So I talked to my friend, the surgeon, who is also from South Africa. And the reason why I spoke to him is because he was always fascinated by the fact that these Sangomas in South Africa, they go and connect, collect in the boondocks in the middle of nowhere, leaves and berries and barks and, you know, bulbs and mix these things together and concoct all sorts of strange smelly substances, give them to their patients and invariably people would get better. So my friend wanted to know why, you know, these aren't big drug companies. How do these people know what to do? How do they know what leaves to choose, which barks to choose, which berries to choose? How do they learn that stuff? So he, as a surgeon and as a South African and he's same age as me, he's in his late seventies, he decided to go back to South Africa to study that system. And he was absolutely fascinated. And when he was out there, he was told that, you know, what you really should be doing is to practice the medicine of, of your African ancestors. You are an African. Uh, you, you come, this is, this, is, this is where you're from. You should practice not only what you do in America, but what your ancestors did here in Africa. You should become a Sangoma. And he thought about this and he thought about this and he thought about this. And after a number of years, he said, OK, I'm going to do that. And he asked me to make a film about that. And I was absolutely delighted to the, for the opportunity. But when I came down with this illness, I, the first person I ran to was to him. And I said, Dave, what do you think I should do? I've got a really wonderful nephrologist. I've got access to some of the best medical care in the world here in L.A. I really have some wonderful doctors. But I don't want to die in 10 years. I still have a lot of movies I want to make, or a lot of books I want to write. How am I going to do this? And he said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You are going to come with me to South Africa on my next uh, trip when I go out there to learn with my teacher about becoming a Sangoma before I become ordained as one, if you like. You're going to make a documentary about that. And in the process of doing that, I'm going to introduce you to all of these Sangomas and maybe they have the answer. And I said, you have to be joking. You are a surgeon here in California. And now you're telling me to go to Africa and consult a witch doctor. And he said, yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you to do. And I said, OK, you're on. And I went back with him to South Africa. And all of those people that I saw that he was working with, they all threw the bones, which is the medium that they use to foretell or to diagnose an illness or a complaint or a problem or whatever the client has, they throw the bones. Now, what does that mean about throwing the bones? The bones, it's merely a, a, a medium between the Sangoma and his ancestral spirits, because the belief is the client, the patient, comes to the Sangoma, says, I'm ill, I've got a headache, I'm sick, my stomach, my this, my that. The Sangoma will take a pile of bones and give it to that person and say, you, you throw those bones onto this grass mat. And the way they fall is dictated to by your ancestors. And now my ancestors, says the Sangoma, will help me interpret the way the bones have fallen, the pattern. And I will interpret your illness from that. So the reading of the bones is from one ancestor to another through the, through, through the Sangoma. And, you know, he, he, he looked at this and uh, he diagnosed my illness. But what was so extraordinary is that my friend Dave was also stunned by the fact that every Sangoma that he ever saw was told him that he, he was told uh, when he was born that it was his calling to come back to Africa and learn the ways of, of the African healer. And so now he's a practicing Sangoma. And uh, when I went back to Africa with him and all of these people were throwing the bones for me, they diagnosed my illness. They basically knew nothing about what was wrong with me. And they all said, yeah, it's an internal organ and it's this. And they basically told me that, you know, it's your kidneys. They knew. And, and how does it work? I have an absolutely no idea. But it does. And the medium is the bones and connecting the bones and the way they fall with the ancestral spirits and the interpretation that they're given, you know, obviously in their mind, by looking at these bones, they see things. I saw an, a woman who I think, Kim, might, you might have read about this woman already that I talked about in my book, 
uh, when I was living in Zambia back in 1964. And this little old lady, she lived, she was a little uh, Bemba woman of the Bemba ethnic group, tiny little, little woman. And I went to see her in a little mud hut under a baobab tree in Central Africa because I lost my job at the television station because the country got its independence from Britain. And so all of us, the whites were given notice to leave the station because the station was nationalized by the government, which was understandable. They've got their independence. Now they're gonna run their own television network, but I lost my job and I didn't know what I was going to do. So we had a wonderful house servant, also a Bemba man. And, and I told him this and he said, ah, I'm going to help find someone who will tell you what to do with your life. And he took me to see this little old woman who lived in this, mid, this mud hut. She'd not, probably never been more than five miles away from this little mud hut in all her life. And she was ancient. She could hardly see. And she threw the bones for me. And everything that that woman told me in 1964, every single thing that she told me has come true. She foresaw it all, including how I would deal with my illness, what I would do with my life, and on and on and on and on and on. It's just extraordinary, the, the energies that these people can tap into by going into the, this world of the ancestors, if you like. And of course, what is the world of the ancestors? These are those who have passed on, spirits who are still out there helping them, you know. That is the paradigm that they use, and it works. It's a fascinating thing to read, all the things she told you and how they came true, Lionel, yeah. And, and yes, it's, a, it's about creating that paradigm, isn't it, that what works? I mean, the ancestors are spirits, yes. And getting around to that illness concept that you, you talked about, I was wondering, I, and I know for me, um, I know that shamanism does often start that way with either a very severe illness or a death of some sort. My probable initiation was around, around puberty when I, as a little girl in Australia, I must have been about 11, ran into what is these days would be called a reptilian alien in broad yeah. daylight out yeah. in the paddock. So there was no real illness. In fact, I had, as a, a young, much younger child, had repetitive dreams of being watched by something bigger than green like a crocodile that was yeah. waiting to get me. But I ran into this one and... And my word was he magnificent. And of course, there was no concept in my country at all about reptilian aliens at mm. that time, none. There was no way I would have heard. And there yeah. were aspects of him that my mind, you know how your mind goes, what does that look like? And it follows a trail to try and get an idea or a concept. There were parts of this magnificent being that had my brain actually in the end stalled. It stopped thinking mm -hmm. and when I made eye contact with him mm -hmm. time stopped and he opened a channel into my brain and spoke to me telepathically and the first thing he said was mm -hmm. I won't hurt you I'm not I'm not going to hurt you so Kim let me ask you this one often hears about reptilians and you hear about them in a in in a malevolent way was this one that you met was benevolent this one was helpful to you Yes, Lionel, yes. And this has taken decades for me to sort, okay, because somebody introduced me to the idea of reptilian aliens long after this event. Up until then, I just had this incredible experience that had no basis anywhere that I knew of. It's only in the last couple of years when I was reading a book by um, Thomas K. Shaw called A Step Away from Paradise, which is about the quest of a a shaman in Tibet to open the doorway into what we would all probably call Shangri-La or, you know, the promised land or whatever. Um, for him, it was Shambhala, I think. It's the Buddhist word for it. It's yeah. known in a lot of cultures, this land, and it's thought of as myth mythical. But he led a troop of people last century, you know, not, not that long ago, to open mm -hmm. this doorway. But during reading that book, I came across the concept of Nagas, Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. The Nagas. Yeah. And yeah. Nagas supposed to be a mythical being that can be yeah. either mm -hmm. benevolent or not.
I think some of today's reptilians, what are called reptilians, are in fact Nagas. And they are the guardians of treasure quite often in terms of wisdom. So if you've got a benevolent Naga on your side, yes. you're going to have an interesting life, I've discovered. <laughs> well, look, at, look at all those amazing temples in Cambodia yes. that, are, that have got Nagas all over the place, right? Yes. Everywhere. Yes. In the temples. Yeah. I know. And Cambodia or Southeast Asia has this concept of Nagas in some way or other. And that's yeah. what I was going to ask you, that lovely story in your book, which I just finished last night when I really should have been asleep, about the lake and uh, that was for the python wasn't it it's a ceremony about yeah. a python you know so i thought yeah. well there it is in africa there's that ceremony around that because a naga can be for those of us who don't know and i will go i will read this because many people don't know what a naga, naga is supposed to be it's a divine or semi-divine race of half human half serpent beings that reside in the netherworld Rituals have devoted to these supernatural beings have been taking place throughout South Asia for at least 2,000 years. They're principally depicted in three forms, holy human with snakes on the heads and necks, common serpents, or a half human, half snake being in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism and other mm. places. They're supposed to be powerful, splendid, wonderful, and proud race that can assume their physical form at, at choice. They can change between that. So what I saw was humanoid, but very much serpent-like. And he was splendid because I looked at that and I was aware that we were nowhere near, nowhere near as perfect in form as this amazing creation was. But it makes you wonder, doesn't it, about myths? Here he was, he was definitely there. And I could talk to him on and off for years, you know, being at that property when he was there and when he wasn't there in my head. I could... how, did you, how were you able to access him and how were you able to make contact? With yeah, him? he didn't really want to talk to me because he made it very plain that first day that this was a massive mistake. He had thought he was invisible to me. So there was a mistake. And I don't believe in mistakes. <laughs> Probably who wouldn't nowadays? But, yeah, he was near a creek and a spring, both of which Nagas are water. They protect the waterways, of course, quite often. Yes, and it's my belief that he'd been watching my family the whole time we'd been living there. And for some reason that day his invisibility just did not work for me and I saw him. So This is, this is in Australia you're talking about now, right? This is Australia. It just didn't happen in the 1960s. Is there not a, an Aboriginal tradition about something like that in that culture? I'm sure there must be. Yeah, the rainbow serpent, of course, the creation myths, the rainbow serpent. And, and mm. to be quite fair, the place that I was in had never been touched other than the paddock bit, but around it was, was still virgin bush. And it was in a part that, of the mountains that is considered to be a part of the rainbow serpent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You find what, what you just told me now, you find this uh, very prevalent in Central Africa. The Zambezi River supposedly has a river god whose name is Nyaminyami. And I don't know if anyone remembers this, but back in the early 1960s, the, the Zambezi River, which is one of the great rivers of Central Africa, was, was dammed, was bridged for a hydroelectric scheme in the middle of nowhere. And they built this enormous dam. And when it was decided to do that, the Batonka people who lived there said, you can't do that because this is Nyami Nyami's home. And if you want to build this dam, Nyami Nyami will come and destroy your dam. And everyone laughed, you know. Then the Italian company came and built this enormous dam. Uh, um, uh, it took years. And every year there was, it hadn't been experienced before, but year after year for four years, in straight, in all, every, every, every year, every four years, they had the most incredible floods. The river came down in floods and washed the entire structure away for four nonstop years until these people went, the, these engineers went back to the Batonka people and said, maybe Nyami Nyami is not happy. And they said, the tribal people said, then ask penance, ask Yami Nyami's permission to build your dam. And it was only when they did that ritual that the next year there was no flood and the dam wall was built. 
And Yamin Yami was kind of satisfied that, you know, um, he was asked permission to do that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and Yamin Yami is a very, very strong, people have a very strong belief in, in Yamin Yami, but it's, but it's universal. You find it everywhere. It's, it's exactly like your Naga story. And I'm quite sure that we find that in many other parts of the world as well. Yes. Now that I look for it everywhere, I find it everywhere I look. There's, there's something about a serpent. Mm. So, well, yes. the water spirit is, is, is you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere, you know. And, and our, our relation to the water, you know, whether, whether you're talking about baptism or you're talking about bathing in the Ganges or whatever it may be, you know, we, we have a strong connection with water because I forget the name of this Japanese scientist who did those experiments with water, oh. but water has consciousness. What is his name? If you play classical music to water, you're changing a substance. You're changing its molecular structure. It's got consciousness. It's absolutely marvelous. And when you talk about this to most people, they think that you're nuts, but it's true. You know, I mean, there's a reason why so many religions believe that water is important. You have to baptize a baby. You have to christen the baby. You know, in the Jewish tradition, you have a thing called the mikvah, which is a ritual bath. The, you know, the Hindus bathe in the Ganges and on and on and on. It doesn't stop. We have known all this, but it's been taken away. So the essence is gone, but, you know, it still sort of lingers in bits and pieces. That water has this incredible healing property. Yes, totally. In fact, I, I meditate with a Christian group once a week. It's very nice of them to let the shaman in. Um, and they're lovely people. But one of them, he, he takes a glass of water into the room we, and we meditate in total silence for peace across the planet. Mm-hmm. And at the end... He drinks the water because it's had all that powerful influence going through it. And, yeah, so, yes, we do know. We do know. Absolutely. Mm. And you know that our bodies are mostly water. And so we do the same thing. When we feel a beautiful emotion, that's uh, our music, our body feels and radiates that consciousness. And when a negative energy comes in, we also go into a lower consciousness. We're, we're water. We're all, you know, we are all created in this, this element of water. And energetically, we, we can raise and lower our frequency with music, with sound, with thought, with all of that. Just like he was proving with the water that he was showing positive and negative effects to. We are the same. We are no different. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, anybody listening would do well to look up Dr. Umato and, and have a look at some of his work. It's, it's an amazing. Yes, his, his work is, ex, is extraordinary. And as just to talk generally about healing and about shamanism generally is the importance of silence. I think you were talking about that earlier. Silence itself is a healing, it's a healing thing. Take away the noise. Get rid of all that, you know, clatter. And silence is such a, such a purity. You, we have to listen to the sound of the world, the sound of the, you know, the sound of the ether. And it has sound, but people are, you know, we're bombarded with radio and television and traffic and you know, <laughs> all this stuff. It's so important to be, I, I go to a little spot in the, in the Mojave Desert north of here from where I live, it's about an hour away, but it's, it's another world entirely. I cross the San Gabriel mountains. When I get to the other side, I'm in the middle of an empty desert. It's absolutely wonderful. And it's the most marvelous place to go to. You just get out of your car. You sit there and to camp there is extraordinary because like being in a planetarium at night, if you don't, you know, if there's no moon and the lights of Los Angeles is down in the south blocked by the mountains. So it's being in another universe and the silence of the sky, the silence of the desert. It's so wonderful. There's a wonderful line of dialogue in Lawrence of Arabia, the film, you know, where at, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the film, but at, at the end of the mm-hmm. movie, you know, we've seen bloodshed and gore and wars and battles. And this newspaper reporter says to Colonel Lawrence, he said, Mr. Lawrence, why do you like the desert so much? You know, I mean, he, he's a British colonel. And he says, because it's clean and it's quiet. And I think it's a wonderful line. And it's so true. Yeah, yeah it really is. At the same meditation, I, I actually found myself once I managed to just tootle off out of my body and found myself at a, at a fire with Native American Indians all around the, the fire. And I suddenly thought, oh, oh, I've got all this wisdom here. I better ask a question. And, yes. I, and I, so I said, 
um, I said to the man sitting next to me at this fire, I said, what's the wisest thing you've ever heard? Yeah. And he just turned his head and looked at me in this, in this vision and he said, silence, for it yes. teems with the voice of the great spirit. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. yeah. And that's so true, isn't it? It just teems with that voice of creation. Mm. And, and that line of, from Bezita Rada, remember what peace there may be in silence. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, of course, and then Shakespeare has one or two little lines here and there as well about things like that. You know, <laughs> Looking to other sources for strength and for inspiration, if you like. I remember struggling with a script that I was trying to write a couple of years ago. And I said to a friend of mine, a writer friend, I said, I don't know what to do with this. I, I, don't, I, I, need, I need help. And he said, well, you know, look to your heroes. And I said, well, yeah, I'd like to be able to ask Ray Bradbury and Arthur Clarke and William Shakespeare and this one and that one and the other one. I'd like to ask them what to do. So he said to me, well, ask them. And I said, but they're all dead. He said, so ask them <laughs> because they are accessible to you. They are. Amen. Yeah, amen indeed. They are. Yeah, they really are. I have a grandson who is, he'll be two years old this month and he doesn't speak, but he communicates and he's very, very special. I've been told that he's just a very, very old, old soul who's come here to do a lot of work. And I've questioned so many times, you know, why he doesn't speak, but he does speak. He speaks and we have to pay attention to what he's saying because he says the most amazing things with just his finger, with just a thought. And I said, you know, again, we're talking about silence. The minute that you speak, that word is open to the perception of everybody else. And all of a sudden your energy is gapped. You know, he's protecting his energy by being silent. It's totally amazing to me to learn this little child. He goes around and yet, Everything he needs and wants is done without speaking, without speaking, just in communicating. And I know mm -hmm. eventually he will speak, but I think right now he is holding that energetic space around him because once you speak, you are again open to the perception of others. And it's, um, he's, a, he's really an amazing teacher and he's two and he doesn't wow. speak, but he there's, does speak. There's a lot of children not speaking young right now. My great nephew is 18 months old and his parents are putting him in speech therapy because he isn't talking no. yet. Uh, My youngest no. grandson wasn't talking at three. And, and it was, right. I mean, he, he was, you know, spotty, but again, it's, it's society deems that geez, by three now they should be counting to 10 and I don't know what all else there's, there's, and there's so much damage. Yeah, a lot of these youngsters that are are speaking late, and I I think it's because there's so much noise around them. How do they choose what to learn in their beautiful little minds? Yeah. They're learning in other ways, and it's, I I've noticed that too, Vicky. Actually, many people have come to me now and talked about the new generation of children because their DNA is already heightened more than ours. They they're coming in with a knowledge that we never even had. And for us to acknowledge that and to acknowledge them and to try and help the parents of these children to know how special they are and what they're bringing into this world right now, rather than put them back into that little box. And it's very tough on parents for sure, you know, because they want to, again, we're, we're judging, we're, we're looking and we're comparing, which is one of the things we need to let go of. No judgment, no comparison. We're all fractals of the sun. But these yes. new children are going to develop a new world for us. And it's important that we support them, really, and learn from them. I've True. learned amazing things. Amazing yeah. things. Yeah. And, and that also comes from that thing about it's okay to be different. You want to be quiet. You don't want to speak. It's okay. When you're ready, you'll be ready. My late sister didn't speak until she was quite old, but when she did, it was in whole sentences. She knew how to speak. She just didn't want to until she was older, yeah. So going back to the Naga, I'm going to go back to shamanism because, yeah, it's a shamanic cosmos that we're discussing, I guess, in so many ways. It's a fascinating conversation. Thank you all. 
So with the Naga, for me, what died that day when I saw the Naga was my belief system about the world. It just crashed and burned. Like, yeah, everything I'd been told about the world had just changed entirely. Yeah. So there was a massive death at that age and it was a belief, a global view crash. So I was wondering, did either of you, you, Vicky, maybe first, was there a moment when there was an initiation actual, you can look back and go, ah, oh, that's when? I don't know that I would say it's an initiation. I think when I've looked back at that as to where maybe there was a connection that I hadn't been aware of before. And I, I feel in that area of about nine years old and riding the rickety old yellow school bus with the windows down up the mountain to summer camp. And when I first started learning about energy and the shifts that happened, I was able to then understand what was happening there. Is as soon as the scent of pines and manzanita hit my nostrils, things shifted for me. And stepping off the plane in Hawaii for the first time in 1986 in, on Kauai, I broke out in tears and I had no explanation for it. I know now it was a coming home, a feeling of of home. And so I, I think for me, there wasn't this huge event, but I do know that without having experienced the teachers that I had and, and being in a position to be learning whatever prompted that, which basically was stories for me, I was an avid reader. And, you know, the, the stories were where my mind went all the time. And without the stories, going back to Medicine Woman, um, I don't know that I would have survived the death of my son. It's one of those things that the communication with him since he's been gone has affirmed for myself and, and even my husband now, which I am so joyous about. He recognizes messages from Ryan and is, is um, willing to share those. So, I mean, that's, that's a wonderful blessing. And it's, um, I think that, that when each of us can begin to realize that there's more beyond what we see and feel here, there, there just has to be more. There's, there's just more. I mean, why would we see, oh, so egocentric to believe that this little planet of ours is the only one with intelligent human beings or intelligent life? And yep. that crossover, that connection, taking a, a guided journey to the stars was eye-opening for me because, wow, yeah, so I was told to meet a star being. So, I mean, the scene is set. But you still have to walk into it and, and believe it. So again, it's it's that allowing of belief to, to be okay that there are things out there other than what we are traditionally taught is rule. And so it allows you to see that that luminous or transparent being that that giggles in the entrance to a cave or you're watching, well, I thought that was the movement in the trees. No, that was an entire tribe walking up the hill with a little boy waving behind me. And those are experiences that if you close your mind off to only hear, you'll never have. So for me, um, always pine and manzanita or to, to be in the water, around the water, surrounded by the water is is where shifts happen for me the most i think another thing that that we we tend to overlook at times is you know the vastness of things the fact that you're talking about this little tiny rock that we live on it's it's, it's a green it's a tiny it's yeah. less than a green uh, the most important thing and people don't do this when you go outside look up tell your kids tell your grandkids the first thing you do look up and sense the scale of what is up there. Even if you don't understand it, just sense it. It's so vast. There is so much more. And as long yeah. as we maintain, we, 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 we have this awareness that there is so much more to know and to learn. And there's so many horizons beyond horizons that, you know, it's limitless. And that's so exciting. So through the movies that you make, through the stories that we tell, the books that are written, the, the 
stories that are passed on from grandparent to grandchild, that's, that's how it, it happens. That's where we start giving people permission to believe beyond being human. Which is why I said earlier about science fiction, because yeah. it really does open that door. Yeah. Yes. It's like, it's like the old fairy tales, you know, and to some extent, you know, the, the Harry Potter's world and all that. But science fiction is it's so much more embracing and, and vast. And as long as it's not all about explosions and monsters and right. you know, green, green things eating up the earth and all that, that that's rubbish. But, but, but intelligent science fiction is such an eye opener and a mind awakener. Climb in the rocking ship in your backyard and take a journey to the moon. There Cardboard rocket ship, right? There you go, exactly. <laughs> Bless Ray Bradbury, absolutely. Yes. Love Br Ray Bradbury. Love John Wyndham's stuff too. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Yes. Mm. yes, yes. I had an experience traveling like that too, like, like you were talking about. I'm extremely connected to Mount Shasta in Northern California, which is a very sacred indigenous site. And um, I was doing a shamanic journey and during my journey, I was shot up to a star and met a star being. And the star being took me directly into the center of the mountain, down in, into the mountain itself, where I met other beings down there. And it connected me to this underground city I, I came to believe, which is called Telos. It's a 5D city below Mount Shasta. And I learned about this through a shamanic journey and I investigated it even more. It really became a part of me. And through this, these beings in this 5D city below Mount Shasta, I learned of my roots coming to earth thousands of years ago to the ancient continent of Lemuria. And I've learned a lot about Lemuria, which actually sank as did Atlantis. But it, it has all been, you know, given to me, gifted to me in a very beautiful way. And what happened recently, which is really what I wanted to say, is I took my mother up to Mount Shasta. She's 94 years old. She's handicapped. She's nearly completely blind. She can't see in one eye and barely in the other. She walks with a walker and she can't hear. But she loves my stories of the mountain. And we just did this about a month ago. I took her to the mountain and she felt this freedom, which was beautiful. And as we drove up to the mountain, she told me, she said, I don't really want to tell you this, but I can see. Wow. She could see the trees and the mountain and her face was like lit up. And she was just like, you know, overjoyed with, not only could she see, but she wasn't in any pain. She got out of the car and stood there in front of the mountain. And I was like, wow, I didn't say anything. You know, I just really didn't say anything. And the whole time that we were there, she had this euphoric feeling and she could see. And it was so beautiful. And then what happened was as we traveled back down the mountain on our way back home, I saw her face completely change and drop. Mm. Mm. And halfway home. She told me that she couldn't, her sight was back to where it used to be. So explanations, I don't really know other than she was open to what was going to happen. She believed in the magic of this place that I go to all the time and going home. She felt like I'm going back to where I used to be. And she allowed herself to fall in that place. But I'm telling you, it was magic. It was a magical thing. Um, the mountain is magic for me. The beings are magic for me. And what happened to my mother was completely magical. And we're actually, I'm taking her to her eye doctor on Monday. And she's going to ask her eye doctor what happened. And I don't believe her eye doctor is going to be able to give her any kind of an explanation <laughs> no. at all. Don't, don't expect it. No. <laughs> but that was, a, that was a true story about, you know, what we can do with our beliefs and these beautiful these, there is energetic places all over the earth that are being activated now. One of them, Mount Shasta, which I know, but many of them, yeah. you know, all uh, in England and in, in Asia and, you know, in Africa, all these places are being really, really activated 
there is people that can feel this energy and it's, it's pretty cool what's going on right now. But my mother's story, I told her, you need to tell your story. This is a cool story. You know, yeah. this, this is an old lady story that really happened. Yeah. 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 And that, that yeah. is the world we need now, isn't it? That the one where she tells the story instead of yes. holding it to herself, that she finds a way to tell that story. It's a beautiful. She needs to do that. You know, and you know what? She has told the story like to my two sons and to my cousin and they're, hmm, okay. <laughs> but pretty much non-belief, you know, like she's an old lady and doesn't know what she's talking about. But all you can do is tell your story. Yeah. You know, that's all you can do. That's I was there. I know the story. That's planting the seeds. It is planting the seed. Yes, it's planting the seed. And so my mother is actually being a catalyst without her even knowing it. She's being a catalyst for change because she's she's so old, so set in her ways. So not the person at all that you would expect this to happen to. Certainly not her, but it did happen. And it it's something that she she can tell. And there was people there that know that too. And I saw her walk. So it was pretty cool. Pretty yeah, cool. It's, it's wonderful. So the, 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 the lesson in this, it's, it's never too late. You know, it's never too late. It's never, never too late. She's 94. She's, yeah, no, it, why am I here? Maybe yeah, for your story, Ma. Yeah, you know? It's, it's wonderful. Very encouraging. If only more people would, 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 would adhere to that and be open to that. And it's never too late to, 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 to be young again, no matter how old you are, you know, open the mind and, yes. and reconnect with origins and who we all are and the vastness of it all. You know, it's never too late to do that. And don't keep yeah. it to yourself. You sharing with your yeah. mother opened her to the possibility and having that wonderful experience. I remember driving my mother in her 80s up to the mountain. She loved to just take a drive and the daffodils were growing at a nursery and and we pull in and she said, I used to soar over a canyon like that when I was a kid. <laughs> Never in a million years would I have believed that of my mother. But she she in that moment shared a piece of her that that I never saw again, other than she was happy for me that, you know, I was experiencing what I was experiencing, but she's the one who taught me to scry the clouds. She, she wouldn't have called it that. She was just trying to keep me busy either in the car or laying on a blanket at a picnic by seeing what I could find in the clouds or, you know, listening to the birds or so many ways that she and, and uh, my paternal grandmother would tell me, well, so how many colors of green are in the tree? I mean, just that has stuck for years in that being able to see more than what we're told to see. Trees are green. Well, how many colors of green? It's in the sharing of those little things that will spark something in somebody else. And isn't that what shamanism is? That transference of energy from in, in the way of thought from one to another, whether it's listening to a rock or the wind or the water or sharing the stories with a child, a neighbor, a friend, a, a, a group of strangers, and, and finding that commonality in listening. And Vicki, I have to say one thing I still share that I have from you is when we went to Hawaii and we were, Lynn was teaching us about water babies. And you took a picture of a water baby. And you had told me the water baby said, take it right now. Yeah. And you send it to me and I still have that picture and I send it out to people. I still use that picture of the water baby that you took in Hawaii. Yeah. I, I have a very logical explanation for what it actually is, but the experience was in the listening. I was sitting on the roots of a tree behind beside the, the sacred fish ponds of Kamehameha at the Manalani. It was that moment of listening. It was, I love watching the light on the water anyway. And, and it was just in that moment, I had no idea what I was taking a picture of. And yeah, I can logically explain it. It's, you know, the upside down reflection of a palm tree, but it is a dancing entity on the water and it's, it is magical. Yeah. And I still have it. That's wonderful. And I still share it. <laughs> See, it only takes one, and it just keeps going. And I still mm -hmm. hear this story about 
watching you, Vicky, you know, when you were so angry with myself and my cousin. <laughs> okay, so I've actually written about this in one of my books, as you know, but just for everybody listening, when I was still training under Lynn Andrews and I, and I went for an event in America and I went with my cousin and we, re- we were only there for three days. So it's a long trip to only be there for three or four days. And we yeah. somehow missed the point that we were meant to be at the beginning, setting up for a ceremony that evening. We just never caught that. So we went on, on, a, on a tour bus of Hollywood <laughs> <laughs> and we were late to, to what we were supposed to be doing. And Vicky was in charge of that. And she was really angry with us, really angry with us. And I was looking at her and all this anger coming out of her. And I, and I just suddenly looked at her eyes and they were the most amazing silver gray, like silver. And I thought, that's really weird. I thought your eyes were dark brown, you know, but <laughs> I, must have, I must have missed that. I didn't, and I didn't think any more about it. And then, um, because we can my good friends. We went out for dinner, was it the next night, I think, or the, that night? I'm not, no, it was the next night. And I was just looking at her across the table and um, and her eyes are dark brown. And I went, hang on, they were great. <laughs> and then she told me what her, her uh, spirit animal is, which is, you know, a wolf. And, of course, it has these amazing silver eyes. So she was starting to shape shift. And that's my real Vicky story is I actually saw another shaman start to, shape shift into her power animal and for for people who don't know what that is shamans do have a main power animal you 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 will have other animals that will come in and help you in different areas but there's a spiritual energy that's associated with particular animals and and there's one for each shaman that will be with them all their lives and multiple lives multiple lives you, you're entwined it's the same energy yes yeah. yeah 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 kim i'm not sure whether you come across the story yet that i told in the book about the elephant have you i certainly haven't it's an amazing story and 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 i so that's my my power animal and that animal is with me all the, all the time that particular elephant is with me to this day yes i can truly understand that lionel yes and, I, and i'm reading that's an amazing story could you, yeah. We've still got a bit of time. Do you want to tell that one? I was working on a film. The reason why I took the job, this is in 1967. The location is Mozambique, which at that time was a Portuguese colony in, in Southeast Africa. And uh, right next to, I'm sure you all know where it is, right next to South Africa on the Indian Ocean. I, I took a job as a cameraman on a safari film. The people who booked the safari, the head guy, was a, the owner of one of the largest toy companies here in California. Uh, a, a lovely man by the name of Arthur Mellon. He had a company called Whammo Toys, and he made a mint of money out of the hula hoop, for those who remember the hula hoop. Yep. <laughs> and, and also the Frisbee. You know, he developed the Frisbee and made a ton of money out of that. So that was his toy company. He decided to go on safari to Mozambique to go and shoot animals. And he took two buddies with him from California, from here, from LA. One was a stockbroker. The other one was an insurance guy and all very successful, very young. They were all in their thirties. I was in my twenties at the time and I took the job. And the reason why I took the job is like, I, I never understood where people got pleasure out of shooting wild animals. What was that all about? And that's why I took this assignment. I wanted to find out a very expensive, well-mounted safari, where is the pleasure that you get out of killing animals and spending a ton of money to do that? What was, what's, what's the point in order to put a head or some you know, uh, horns up on your wall back home? Didn't make any sense to me. That's why I took the job. So anyway, off I go to Mozambique with these three guys, plus two white leaders of the safari um, and a bunch of other local tribesmen uh, in trucks in order to pick up the carcasses of all the animals that they were shooting. <laughs> and it, it was carnage. It was absolute carnage. And none of it made any sense to me at all. And I would have endless arguments with these three guys at night over their martinis and think, you know, why do you do this? And, you know, they'd say, ah, look, we've been doing it for millions of years, you know, shut up already. You know, it's, it's get, get used to it. That's what humans do. That's what guys do for fun. You know, <laughs> right. So anyway, oh comes the day that one of the uh, the, the hunters, the, the stockbroker, it was his turn to shoot an elephant. 
And they all had a license. They could shoot one elephant each. They could shoot one buffalo. They could shoot one lion, plus all sorts of other animals. And it was this guy's turn to shoot his elephant. So the two leaders of the safari, they both picked out. We, 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 we tracked this herd on foot. And um, I shall never forget, it took about 48 hours before we caught up with them. Tracking through the, through, through the bush, you know, with a very heavy film camera those days long before video, but the camera was heavy. I had a man walking next to me carrying a big, heavy wet cell battery pack. Um, it was a whole deal. But anyway, we eventually found the herd and these two white hunters picked out an old bull on the side of the herd. And they said to the stockbroker, that's the guy you aim for, but make sure you get a clean shot. You know, get him right here between, between the eyes. That's the, that's the only way you can kill an elephant immediately. Yeah, 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 says the, 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 the stockbroker. Don't worry about it. I'll do that. But he was a terrible shot. Anyway, mm -hmm. so he lined himself up with mm -hmm. his rifle to shoot that elephant. I lined myself up right behind him with my camera. So I've got in my viewfinder him in front of me with his rifle. And in the background is the herd of elephants. It's a perfect shot of this man who's about to murder this poor animal. And he shot and he missed. And the herd just went absolutely crazy. They went scattering in every direction, thundering. Uh, it was like an earthquake, dust and noise. And all I could hear were voices shouting, run, run, run. Well, I couldn't see a thing in the viewfinder because I was still holding the camera running film. And all I could see was dust. And then in this dust, I eventually saw an elephant running towards me. And what had happened was the hunter had run out of my shot. Why? Because when the herd scattered, it left one elephant in the middle of the herd and it was a female and she had a baby with her. And she knew that there was a, a hunter was around shooting guns. Her baby was in danger and she wanted to protect her baby. So she decided to attack the hunter. She came charging towards him. Now he'd run away and there I am with my camera running and she's running towards me. And if I, you know, I, I would have been killed. Um, and all I heard was run, run, run. You know, all these white hunters yelling. I couldn't move. I absolutely couldn't move. The camera was too heavy. I had this guy next to me with the battery. And this elephant was getting bigger and bigger and bigger in my frame all the time until I heard suddenly bam in my ear. And one of the white hunters shot her right between the eyes. And she collapsed maybe eight feet away from me. It was absolutely horrific. It, it completely broke my heart. I know she wasn't chasing me. She was after the guy who was threatening her baby. And as she dropped down onto all fours, her eyes and mine locked together. And I knew that something very, very strange happened that very moment because her soul and mine became enmeshed. One, we became united. She became part of me. And I, I don't hesitate to say this. I've said this in public many, many times, and people look at me as if I've, you know, I'm certifiable. But it happened. This elephant's soul and mine became one at that moment. We, we joined together, and then she died, you know? And years and years later, when I had this illness, which I was talking about earlier, and I went to see all these other uh, uh, Sangomas, every time they threw the bones for me, here's the most extraordinary thing. Every time they did this, and, and I'm talking about 20, 25, 30, 40 years after the incident, they would always look at the bones and say, they'd go like this, uh, which is a, a method of indicating surprise. They, they'd say, what is this Ndlovu in your bones? And Ndlovu is the Zulu word for elephant. They always saw the elephant in my bones, the way the bones fell. Why is this elephant here with you? Well, I wasn't going to tell them the story, but she was still there and they could see that. And, you know, um, the most amazing thing is that this, this was also predicted to me by that little old lady that I mentioned earlier when she threw the bones to me. She said, one day you must be very, very careful because in the, you will be in doing your work. She didn't know what I did. She said, well, you, would, you, you will be doing your work and this beast, you will almost die from this great beast. And I had no idea what she meant by that until the event happened that day in 1967.
And it was only that night sitting back at base camp, you know, nursing our martinis. I suddenly thought, you know, I could have died today. And then it hit me. Oh, my God, that woman saw that years ago in a little mud hut in Central Africa. She foresaw this. And that elephant and I have been together ever since. I have an elephant hanging from the rear view mirror of my car. I've got elephants all over my office. And that elephant spirit is with me right to this day. And I know that she's protecting me. There's no question about it that that animal is my sacred animal and she's my protective animal. She, she's, she's protecting me. And it's, 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 it was the most amazing thing when it happened because it was foretold. Again, you know, the shamanic connection. Uh, it's just extraordinary how she knew that and how that elephant has been with me ever since. It's absolutely amazing. I worked on a series of shows for Animal Planet some years back, 2000 and 2004 to 2006, a season of, 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 of shows called Growing Up. And these were about baby wild animals that had been um, rejected by their mothers for various reasons. And one of the stories was about a baby elephant. And, you know, every time I went to this baby elephant that she was being taken care of in an elephant sanctuary in, in Arkansas, here in the United States, Every time I went there, this little elephant used to come charging up to me and wrap its little trunk around me as though we were old friends. She knew, you know, I was mm -hmm. her cousin. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just amazing. So again, it's connections. You know, if we can just build up this, the strength of connections and realize how, 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 how much we all share so much of the DNA of the cosmos together, all of us. Oh, it's an amazing story. There's some other amazing stories in your book, but it's not just that in this realm, look, it continues. There's no death. Those those connections are just, death's just a transformation. We're still attached. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. yes, everything. And the more Absolutely. we understand that, the more we can do and the more that we can experience and the, the greater yes. we can make the peace and compassion on this planet just by understanding how yes. everything is the one consciousness mm. i like to think that you and that elephant united over useless killing you know the, the senselessness that there was a real I, soul I, I, connection I, I, about it. I think we did i think we did and she certainly imparted that lesson to me because ever since that day i have been deeply aware of what we humans do to the non-human world and, and feel very, very guilty about that. And I, I, whenever I can, I try to do something about that. I'm an animal activist and all. I have to be because, you know, it's just what the way we, the way we humans and the non-human world are, are loggerheads because of our greed and our uh, all sorts of other reasons, you know, we, we need to fix that. We need to get that right. We need to bring back Harmony, we, that, that lovely painting, you know, the lion laying down with the lamp, right? We need to get back to that. We are. We are We're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. The new earth. All right. So our shamanic tools, well, for me, I hear, well, I'm clear we're audient for starters. So I hear voices. I've always heard voices. I've heard them as long as I remember. And they're going back preschool. So, and they're always, mine are always pleasant voices. So. I think I just learned as a little girl, you listen to the, the ones that are teaching you things that are good. So anyway, I was fortunate there, clear audience. But my, one of my main tools is actually dream work because, and in many cultures, the, the word for shaman and the word for dreamer are virtually the same thing. So I do an enormous amount of dream work and I do um, traveling in my dreams. I have lucid dreams. I talk dreams. I run dream circles for people because for me, that's one of the things the Western world, everybody dreams all across the globe. We all dream. And something the Western world has done that is, to me, again, horrific is has downplayed dreams so much. And I'm not talking about strict um, Jungian, you know, analysis of dreams. I'm talking about a shamanic perspective on dreams where things in the dreams can be your dead mother talking to you, can be, you know, a, a spirit guide saying, hey, listen, you need to go and get this checked or have you thought about this piece of wisdom? You know, this would fit, fit in well with, with the world now. Being receptive in dreams and, and voyaging in dreams. It's a fabulous altered brainwave state, which is what drumming does, which is what chanting does, 
which is what so much dance does. It alters the brainwave state, makes you into a receptive state. So that's me. So what are your favourite modern day tools? Do you use the ancient ones? I love rattling too. But, mm. <laughs> Vicky. I have a spiritual centre here. It's right in here. And I lead uh, drumming. I started up a drumming circle quite a while ago, and I, I lead drumming circles here in my centre. And so um, I do a lot of shamanic journeying. We make a lot of tools. Um, we, we always do, we, we go, we always do something that will help like a, a, a talking stick or we'll make a stick with a, a prayer on it or an intention and put it in the fire. And I found that um, these kinds of tools really help people that have not gone into this type of work before. It's very, very easy for them to take a journey, especially children, like I talked to before. Drumming, um, learning about your power animal. Kids absolutely love that. There's nothing cooler than to see kids running around a fire and screaming their power animal, whoever they are. I mean, they've come up with animals I don't even know. That kind of work I, I do here at the center. Um, and I use all kinds of tools that, you know, as Vicki knows, because I have a lot of her drums, I have a lot of rattles, I have a lot, but mostly what it is, is creating a journey each time and creating a task each time. If it's bringing in an ancestor and bringing in pictures of your ancestors, doing something that means something. And I, and I did learn this a lot through Lynn's school, but during the time that I've done this, I've also been... I've learned about something called the Stargate and the Stargate is something that I have here in my center, which kind of amplifies the work that we do here. So every single time that I have a drum circle or that I have a Stargate, I speak to the ancestors and I ask them, what is it? Or what are we going to do today? What is it? I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm merely a tool myself, a tool for spirit. You know, what, what is it that those coming here today will need. And I never know if there's one person or 10 people that are coming here. I don't know. And usually what I'm guided to do is whatever the people coming here are needing, whatever that may be. And, and I just find that the tools that we use, and I have a, a lot of them, they're sitting on the wall, all kinds of things, you know, different things, but it's mostly the task that I've been guided to, to, to do, whatever it may be. If it's just taking something that is a dark shadow of yours, you know, that, that, that you really want to release, you know, and doing a little paper of it and putting it in a bowl. And then later on, we take it out to the fire and burn it or doing a despacho or, you know, something like that. It's, it's doing things to help people move into some part of themselves that they would not do in normal 3d world. And, you know, that's what I found. I do, and I don't do really the Zoom thing. Like I said, this is completely new for me. My center is really, really very spiritual in itself. It has an essence that feels beautiful. And people like to come here, even if it's just to sit because of what's been created here. And so that's, that's kind of how I work with my shamanic background and incorporate it into this new Stargate that I work with. Also, it's, it's a combination of what I call heaven and earth moving it all together. And it's, I'm guided. It's, Hey, I don't know what I'm going to do next week, but I'll ask in some kind of way I'll get guidance as to this is what you should do. Could you just explain the Stargate a little bit? The Stargate is a geometrical figure, much like a pyramid. What it does is it anchors a consciousness, basically kind of like what pyramids do. It was given to a gentleman named Pragit about 30 years ago, and he channels a guide called Alcazar. And Alcazar has been working with him for over these 30 years. And it's like leading edge consciousness. The energetic that comes in through the Stargate helps raise the energy in, in the room. So everybody that's in the room, we go into a meditative state. So not only am I using my shamanic journeying, but I use the energy of the Stargate which elevates and activates our own frequencies to a higher frequency because we are a frequency. We are 
all of us are just an energy. And our own energy comes with that. As we activate the stargate and raise the frequency of the stargate, we raise our own frequency, doing nothing. We just lay there and bring ourselves to this higher frequency. And when we get into this state, we are into a complete non-ordinary reality. And it's a way of us um, releasing a lot of these old patterns and beliefs that we hold. It, it's, a, it's a way of moving up, releasing, and, and bringing in some new energies. It's, it's quite fabulous. And the two work perfectly together. And I channel a guide in uh, Talos, which is the city below Mount Shasta, named Adama, Master Adama. And he is the one who's been guiding me recently to bring in the shamanic tools, because that's what we did originally on Earth. Millions of years ago, when we first came here, we were basic people. And so bringing in the energies, again, of the Earth, which is a consciousness, the Earth is a consciousness, as, a, as are we, with the energy of the Stargate, it brings people into this most beautiful state where they can actually really dream and really move into different. I think I'm getting zapped. <laughs> anyway, the Stargate. Thank you. Kind of like putting a pyramid over yourself, you know, and bringing your, your vibration into a higher level. Using that along with drumming with your shamanic tools, it, it's quite an activation. Okay, thank you. And very leading edge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hadn't heard of it described that way. Yeah, that's great. Vicki, what do you use? Oh, no, really. Well, that's a silly question for those that know me. I am a drum maker. And uh, I think for me, creativity is the greatest source of movement. In order for there to be any kind of movement within yourself, within the, the family, the tribe, the, the community, there has to be movement. So going back to some of the, the older ways that, that were studied, often the, to, for lack of a better word, the, the apprentice or the adept was given a chore to do. So they were tasked with making something or moving something or cleaning up something. And for me, it is in that act of creation in the making of a drum where there's also a, that in itself is a meditation. It's also a prayer. So in bead work with every bead, I pray the word bead itself is from an ancient Aramaic word, B-E-D-E, -E, which means to pray. And so I think from, from my perspective, it's creativity. So that's why I've taught, and Diane's Healing Center is an amazing place to teach at drum making, rattle making, and bead work, basket weaving, prayer sticks, prayer feathers, energy paintings, writing. It, it's whatever the act of creativity is, the, the movement is where you are moved and through which you are moved. And so to get somebody out of their logical head and into the, the, the mind of their heart or their soul, you got to move them. So what better way to move them to give them something to do with their hands so they get out of their head? I actually, I'm not a good meditator. I'll go for a walk and the same thing happens. It's the repetitive action. We'll You're moving. Take, yeah, I'm moving. Mm, yeah, lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And Lionel, do you use any of those sorts of practices at all? Or? Well, it's 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 I, I do I do a number of things. Um, my 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 go to place um, here in my office. Um, I, I I've been to every continent on the planet nine. You know, I was also I made a film in in Antarctica, and that was the last one where I got a little. I, I collected stones and pebbles and bits and pieces of the Earth from all over the world. Um, so I've got a piece of every continent in my office on a, I call it my midden. I've got four shelves. It's my <laughs> midden. And, and in there are bits and pieces, pebbles and little stones and little bones and things that they, they have no value whatsoever, except for me. They connect me with the energy of the place. And so I have these four middens that I have in my office and, and I often just go and stand in front of that. And I feel this energy coming out of there. 
and you know I can partake of that. But I do meditate twice a day um, in the morning and at night, uh, every single day. I have to make time for that. And um, but the other thing, of course, is um, listening to the world, and it may just be listening to the wind blowing through the uh, the, the pine needles, um, or, um, water flowing. On, on a river, it, it doesn't have to be anything orchestrated, but then I do love music as well. And, and um, I love the sound of, of individual um, instruments, like, you know, like the Japanese flute on its own, with maybe a drum just to enhance it. But, but I love any sound that is deep, you know, like a double bass, that, that low um, rumbling sound. I think it's an interesting thing because the lower the sound vibration, the further it can travel, we now we know that you know it's it's a law of physics that 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 low frequency sounds travel longer distances, and I like that because it resonates with me. It sort of goes to the marrow. You can feel it inside you, and I think why I love drumming so much as we all do is because it resonates with the heartbeat. You know, we all grew up with that. The first sound we heard was our mother's heart, as we grew up inside our mothers. You know, and and it resonates with that, so it's, 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 it's touching that, and yeah. and those are the things that you know I can always turn to those things, and no matter what kind of a jam I'm in or a fix I'm in, you know it'll fix things. I'll be able to you know get going once I get there, plus a big shot of caffeine just to get going. <laughs> I love I love your story of the rocks, Lionel. It's I haven't been blessed to be able to travel like that, but wherever I have been little stones come home and I've had friends who've traveled the world. And so I have a, a, a part of a brick from the cobblestones in Verona being repaved. I have yes. coral from, you know, the shore of Spain. I have pebbles from mm -hmm. Lake Erie and, and wherever people have gone, they always say, you know, what can, and I just always say to them when they leave, just listen, if a, if a little stone catches your attention, if you look down for no reason other than you have no clue why, and there lays a little stone, ask it if it wants it to up. come live with me. Yeah, I have exactly. a, a piece of the Russian wall that was taken down and and the stories, that's that's a book I'm going to write some ways, the stories of the stones, mm -hmm. because all you have that's to do. Wonderful, that's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book. Do yeah. that because it's not been done and it is so important. Just sit I, with I, a stone. I, yeah, absolutely. Can you imagine being a pebble and watching the 90 billion an hour people go by and wonder yes. why they're going so fast? <laughs> How long it's been there, you know? That yeah. Time, millions and millions of years. Yes. To, to one come of, into existence, you know? You know? One and of the classes know, I teach. Yeah. Oh, it's just called, you know, stone teachers you know having conversations with a rock it's a class i teach you know i'm not sure whether whether this is um i'm on the right track or not but anything that's made of molecules and atoms exists right because the atoms vibrate it's all about vibration right if it's vibrating then it exists what what is causing that vibration uh, what's making it do that? What makes a rock a rock and a, and a drop a drop because of different kinds of vibrations and molecular structures? If we understand that, you know, we can start having an insight into what those things are all about. And because even stones and pebbles have a vibration which makes them what they are, they are alive. Yes. And there is consciousness in the soil and in those yes. rocks and those stones as well. Yes. So if you tap into that, it is on such a basic bottom level of all things, you know. I have a little piece of a meteorite that somebody gave me, and you know, and I carry that with me all the time. Yeah. It's my little piece of the cosmos that I have with me all the time. I send people on a journey to the stars with a piece of moldavite in one hand and a stone with a word on it in the other, and I tell them, ask the, the moldavite to take you back to the planet it came from, and Ask the teacher there what the words on the stone and the other hand have for significance for you. So you, the yeah. stones, the crystals, they, they're massively amazing storytellers. If we just slowed down okay. enough to listen to them, there's that totally key so. word again, listen. You know, if you take the letters in the word listen, they spell silent. 
Yes, that's right. Goodness me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I never thought of that. My goodness. That's wonderful. It's, it does. Yes. So we should get together, Lionel, and write the stone stories. Mm. Well, so where are you? You're, you're, you're in my well, California. Country. Yeah. Well, let's do that. Let's get together and write that book on the stones. The stones. You got book. it. Stone stories or the stories of the stones or whatever. It'd be fascinating. A stone speak. There's the, yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. I've got stones everywhere. <laughs> So yeah. many stones, so many stories, yeah? <laughs> and I've never done it without asking somebody, but I, I have a little piece of the Great Pyramid. Uh. I have a little piece of, <laughs> of Angkor Wat. I have a little piece of the Sphinx. And I said to my guide, I said, can I climb under that rope barrier? And he said, yeah, don't let anyone see you. But, but he said, yeah, I'm watching you. And I said, do you see that little pebble lying at the back of the, of the Sphinx on the ground there? I don't know if it's part of the structure, but can I take it? He said, just don't tell anyone. Yeah, take it. So I've, I've never taken anything that I haven't asked for. I either right. ask the place or the stone or the person. So I have a piece of you know, all these special places. And, you know, and I feel their energy here with me. Therein lies one of the keys to a shamanic practice, asking permission. Yeah, you Absolutely. must do that. Oh, you, I must do, you must do that. Yeah. yeah. Very yes. important key. Yes. It is. It is. Yeah. I actually went on a journey with a friend in Canada. I took a small pouch of tiny Herkimer diamonds that I had bought from Mike Engelstrom. And we did prayers and ceremony. And when I was finished with the class I was teaching, my friend took me to a glacier. And I have never been so in awe of mm. the creation. I mean, when you stand over a volcano, you're you're inhaling the first breath of the mother. Well, when you stand at a glacier, it's 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 life. It's a birth of life as as we know it. And from that point, we started putting these prayer infused Herkimer diamonds into every body of water we passed. So it started in um, outside of Calgary, Banff, wherever that glacier that I can't remember the name of was, it's the only one where the water flows three ways, not just two. And we rivers, whatever creeks we pass, we roll the window down and toss these Herkimer diamonds into the bodies of water. And I continued that over in, in the Toronto area, visiting a friend. And we drove around and did the same thing. We drove down to Herkimer, New York. And I was blessed to do a guided dig where we actually opened a Vogue that had never seen the light of day before. And these amazing crystals were born into my hands out of the muck inside that Vogue. And it's, um, it's an amazing journey. And the connection of, of the crystals to our hearts, our, our, our own beingness to the earth and to the stars as like you hold a Herkimer diamond, you're holding something that's 500 million years old. And to hold one that has a drop of water inside an air bubble, I mean, that's like about as pure source as you can go. Yeah. And yeah. So I could talk stone stories for days. So, <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's, it's little, you know, um, gatherings like this, that, that, that inch us towards that, you know, bit by bit. And we need to expand this. And so I, I salute all of you for for doing this, um, you know, um, um, Michael and, and Kim, particularly, you know, you both invited me to join you today. And, and, and I just want to take, you know, uh, my hat off to, to both of you for, for what you're doing, for doing things like this, because it's so important. It's so necessary today. And as long as we keep the, the ripples spreading, you know, there's still hope. As long as we can keep doing that, you know, that, that those just keep throwing those pebbles in the water and let those ripples reach the end of the bank. You know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll still get things right. I echo that gratitude, Kim. Thank you for, for inviting me and, and Michael, what a joy it's been to meet new people and to wave and look into the eyes of old friends, even when they're blue and angry. <laughs> I thought that was a beautiful story, but thank you too, Kim. It was good to see you again. I hope we'll we'll see each other again for sure. And all of you that have been here, this is beautiful. And you're you're right. We need to do more of this. Yeah. Yeah.
We Even do. if there's two people that listen, that tell two other people, that tell two other people, that's the ripple, right? It's the starfish story, right? You know the story of the starfish, right? The, 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 the <laughs> storm comes up and all the starfish have been washed up on the beach and there's a man throwing them back into the water one by one. And, and a guy comes up and says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, you know, I'm throwing starfish back in the water. He said, you won't make any difference. And he said, oh, really? To this one, I do. And he, you know, he throws it back. That's what it's about. Yes. Yes. It is. It is. Beautiful. Well, I really appreciate all of you take, making the effort to be here and, and everything you've brought to the discussion. I feel like we could go on and on and on, really. We could just yeah. keep on talking. We? Yeah, but, yes, it is. It's about the discussion and, and where it goes and, and just that little ripple and giving permission to people to listen and to talk about their own things. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, we, let's let's do it again. I can maybe suggest one or two people to bring on to the panel and, you know, also to just make the voice a little louder and get it out, get the message out there. Yeah, I'd love that, Lionel. In fact, because I run the GOSH group every couple of weeks, I'd love to have you, you know, if you had some people you wanted to have a discussion on there, that'd be great. And thanks to Esther, who I know is listening, for introducing us. Yes, Esther, thank you for this. So this obviously is very much my subject as well, and I'm deeply immersed in it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been this close a friend of Lionel's, as you could imagine. I found it very, very interesting. Thank you so much for all that information. You're all marvellous. It's great work, and it's all true, and we know it, and every little bit makes a difference. Yeah, it does. This woman is incredible. She's a facilitator. She has a knack of getting people together, the right people together. She's really quite amazing. Many blessings to you all, my friends. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me on today. Um, uh, appreciate it. And and yeah, let's we'll talk about you know doing some more of this. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I I love your logo. Let me just say something about that logo of the, that child. You know, my my. My favorite film in the history of the universe is 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, and, and that is the star child. That image of that little baby on the Gaia there, that's the closing image of 2001. I love it. So, you know, that's what the film it's about. It's about the search for, you know, yeah. the intelligence behind the universe and rebirth. Just let me briefly explain what where that came from. So years ago, this is 1986, 87, I did a magazine called The Crystal Visionary. Yeah. And I got that image. It was sort of like a half dream, I guess you'd call it. And mm -hmm. I worked with an artist to bring that to life. And then I went to America in 1987 for the Harmonic Convergence. And in Los Angeles airport, I saw another magazine called World and I, which had exactly the same thing without the crystal though, and much, mm. much more like the um, logo that I'm using now. So that's why I kind of wanted to use that as the mm. eventual logo for Beyond Being Human. It's the yeah. perfect thing, like the merging of Gaia and the universe and the human being. Oh, I would just, with much gratitude thank all of you who are here and all of the beings who are here the seen and the unseen and the world that surrounds us and the universe for being present for bringing to mind the things that were important to share and for having the words to pass out to whoever may hear this in encouraging them and anybody that they know to pick up a stone and listen to take a minute in the wind and listen, to remember the peace that may be in silence. Beautifully said. Thank you. I agree. Uh -huh.